Hello, welcome. Let's talk about the guns of the Highwaymen. My name is Joey Dillon. I was the armorer and did some tech advising as far as the guns and gun gear go. I love doing historical films. That's sort of my specialty. And it was an absolute blessing to be a part of Netflix's The Highwaymen. I can't thank everyone enough for bringing me on board and letting me do this. Now, when you get a script, a lot of times specific things are written as far as the weapons go, and then there are creative entities involved, and everybody puts their two cents in as the film gets made. Um, I put in my two cents about what was historically accurate, but, you know, in the end it wasn't 100% accurate, but it was definitely entertaining, and uh, it was an absolute blast to work on. I work with independent studio services, pretty much a one-stop shop for anything you need in the film industry, especially prop-wise. Their armory is no exception, and they got pretty much everything, and if they don't have it, they'll make it or they'll get it, and uh, here, here were my gun carts when I was getting ready for the film, doing a little bit of shopping. Now let's talk about Old Lucky. Here are some actual photos of the actual Frank Hamer gun. Now this was a Colt single action army, 45 caliber. It was given to him as a gift by a very appreciative county attorney in 1910. It was originally nickel plated. He wore this gun well into his old age, despite the film sort of showing that he put it away and wasn't as good as he used to be. By his son's account, he wore this thing in his waistband even as an old man, and uh, so a lot of the nickel has been worn off. It shows hard black rubber grips. I read accounts that originally it had ivory or pearl, and you can debate that, but here's a photo, 1921, Frank Hammer wearing Old Lucky, obviously white grips. So basically I told the director, look, you, aesthetically speaking, you can get away with whatever you want. You want black, ivory, or pearl. Now, Old Lucky originally was C engraved, and basically there were different levels of engraving from the factory. You had A, B, and C. A, 25% engraving. B, 50% coverage. And uh, C, 75% engraving coverage. The attorney who gifted this weapon also had the back strap engraved, and it said F, A, Hamer. For Frank Hamer's Old Lucky in the movie, we didn't have the time uh, nor the budget to match engraving for engraving specifically and exactly on the hist from the historical firearm to the one we use in the movie. Uh, but basically, my buddies at ISS, Independent Studio Services, were cool with ordering one that I found online that was already three-quarter engraved. It was a genuine Colt. And now, I do a lot of Westerns. I love the old films like I said and uh, I use a lot of the Italian clones which are great and fine uh, but I knew that this gun being like King Arthur's Excalibur uh, may have some extreme close-ups and a lot of glory given it and I wanted to make sure that if got if we got close with the camera we wouldn't see any Italian marks or anything getting in the way of a pure genuine Colt so we found one that was three-quarter engraved now this one was blue in color uh, blued in color case hardened and with a little trick, I was able to strip it down to what we call in the white, which gave it a really nice sort of antiqued, worn look to it. ISS sent out the back strap and had it engraved. And uh, the director thought, you know, pearl grips would look nice. So I fit a set of imitation pearl grips to it, used a little, little bit of shellac to give it a sort of yellowed, aged look. I made it look a little more uh, like realistic pearl grips. It actually brought out a bit more of a of the pearl with the shellac on it, I think, than the uh, plastic look it had before. Now this shows the rubber gun, uh, the double uh, to the hero. A lot of times we'll have a backup to the hero. On this movie, we have we had only uh, the one hero gun for Old Lucky. Any of the stunt work scenes, we may have the rubber one. There was an ultra soft rubber present as well, depending on how close it. It got to uh, someone else's face for any of the stunt work or things like that. Now, Costner liked carrying the real gun at all times if possible, even if the camera wasn't close enough to tell. Woody actually asked for the rubber gun as much as possible. Guess you don't need the extra weight hanging in your trousers if you don't need it. 
Now I had a, an extra set of grips I did make for the Hero Hamer gun, just knowing that if I didn't have a backup to the gun, I better have backups to the grips, and that if it ever came to a point where the gun dropped and the grips broke, I'd have to swap them out pretty quick and I'd be ready for it. Now the gun did come out of Coster's pants once while he was chasing the red-haired kid. Uh, yeah, made me cringe as it tumbled across the concrete, and I can't believe it. It was a miracle. Amazingly, the grips were fine. The gun was fine. I, I don't know. It was a, it was a miracle. But every take after that, I said, you better use the rubber gun uh, while you run after this kid. And although they decided, or Kevin and everybody decided, he'd wear the gun in his waistpants, not in a holster, and definitely not a gun belt with his suit, he did like before the ambush scene, he'd be dressed a little more for business. And uh, Kevin liked the old pictures of Hamer and his gun belt he wore with the rifle cartridges on it as well, which I'll admit is pretty awesome. And he did like also uh, some of the pictures where Hamer was actually wearing it backwards, buckle in the back, cartridges in the front, and that's what we did. My buddy David Carrico, who makes a lot of the gun leather, for a lot of the westerns I work on, stitch up a really cool belt. And I got the Remington dummy rounds in front for the rifle he would use at the ambush. And I also had David throw in a couple rows of the 45 long colt near where Old Lucky would be sitting. Sent me a really beautiful belt. And uh, then I set to aging it and distressing it so it looked like it had seen some miles on the trail. Now, there is some debate historically whether Hamer carried Old Lucky the day of the ambush as his backup pistol or if he actually carried a 1911 model Super 38. Basically, we went with Old Lucky. It just fit the movie better. I think it fit Hamer's character better. Again, he carried Old Lucky until, I mean, well into being an old man. So he didn't carry a 1911 in his trousers the rest of his life. I think this was the gun and... It was just part of him. So I think second nature, uh, I think he would have carried old Lucky. I chose another 1873 model Colt single action army for Maney Galt, figuring he'd just grab what he's been used to his whole life and what was left over from you know the days he served as a Texas Ranger. So I chose a gun that looked a, a bit haggard and worn, something he'd had you know for a long time. This is an Italian clone, uh, and, but it looked the part. Woody decided he would also carry his gun in his pants. Sometimes he would carry it in the front, sometimes in the back. In the back, we had the luxury of part of the suspenders to help secure the gun. But they sewed sort of a sock-like pouch in the front for the barrel to slide into like a holster. Because without a belt, this thing would just not stay in his pants and it would end up down through his pant legs down to his ankle so they did a little bit of trickery there to keep it staying in his waistband kevin after going over the scenes had a good point that when it comes down to times when they might actually encounter bonnie and clyde in their investigations they should maybe have some shotguns and be prepared uh, not just the handguns uh, it was a good point we gave costner there a remington model 11 for woody we gave an old side by side an old Stevens 311. I think it was a Montgomery Ward rebrand. This is actually a gun I brought with me, just sort of a backup for any needs that I might have on set, and it worked out well for Woody. It's actually my dad's old gun. When I was young, I sort of procured this from him, liberated it. Uh, all my life growing up, I never had a stock on it, so I bought it and put a stock on it and fixed the safety. I put a brass but played on it and made it a workable gun again. My dad's actually got his name there machined on the side. John Brown. It's a little cameo shout out to my pops there. Now anytime Bonnie and Clyde's car would play, we would try to match the arsenal and some of these historical photos. Load up the seats with a bunch of really cool historical gack. For the newspapers in the film, they needed photos that closely matched the historical photos, but using our actor and actress and the weapons we had on hand. So we did the best we could, trying to get close to 
the look of the old photos and the guns of the old photos. We hung the hung the guns on the car and leaned them against the car just like the originals. The original guns were stolen or taken from law enforcement officers, well, some of them anyway, uh, that they had abducted and toyed with and then let go. There's a story, especially that triple lock hanging on the hood ornament there was uh, from a specific law enforcement officer that they had taken and then let go. Whenever Clyde would play on camera, we made sure he had his chopped down BAR next to him. Now, ISS already had one on the shelf that was in a cut down configuration, so that's that was a nice score. Uh, also on the shelf, check these out. They had a pair of perfect Whippet guns for Bonnie. These are cut down Model 11 Remingtons. Now, these are actually 12 gauge, but the script called for 20, so we just called them 20, and we're never really close enough with the camera to tell. These Remington uh, Model 11 shotguns and the Model 8 rifles, which we'll talk about later, are recoil-operated systems, not gas-operated as far as cycling to that next round. So if you want them to shoot blanks, most of the time with weapons, you'll put a restrictor in the barrel to create some back pressure, which will then operate the gun, let's say 1911 or an AR or any of that stuff. But these used recoil, and there's just not that recoil with the blanks. So it takes some novel engineering to create the shotgun to cycle for the next round. ISS had already done that for another film and made these work with blanks, the shotguns. Here's a good photo showing all the weapons I had present for the ambushed Barrow car, as well as using some of this for the dressing on the seats for some of the other scenes of the Barrow car earlier in the movie. I wanted to make sure I covered all my bases, historically speaking, um, t to have all the weapons on hand that were supposedly there. Now, if you read Hinton's book, he talks about three BARs, Bonnie's shotgun and pistol, four 45 auto 1911s, three 38 auto 1911s, 50 mags of 20 rounds each for the BAR, and over a thousand rounds of other ammunition. If you read Hamer's account, he also mentions three BARs, uh, nine Colt semi auto pistols, he doesn't designate the calibers. One revolver, three bags, and one box containing about 2,000 rounds of ammo. One at least containing 40 mags for the BAR. And then looking at other sources of information, they mentioned a 1901 model Winchester lever action shotgun and 10 gauge, which I thought was awesome. Uh, they also talk about seven semi auto pistols, the 1911s, of course. Uh, they talk about a 32 auto, 1903 model Colt and a double action revolver, which was possibly a 1909 model revolver, and that's what I pulled in 45. Supposedly, Bonnie had on her thigh, according to one account, a Colt Detective Special, 38 caliber, and in her purse, a 25 auto Colt that was nickel-plated. Years later, at auction, the family of the gentleman who performed the autopsy slash embalming claims that he found a 1902 model Colt semi-auto, 38, nickel-plated, in the folds of Bonnie's skirt, or something like that, uh, and they, they auctioned that off. you got to wonder, if did he find that, or did he kind of cash in and say, oh, look what I found in the, in the skirt. Um, how would that not have fallen out? I don't know. Uh, but it's a cool-looking gun. I threw it in there as well, because uh, more guns are awesome. So we pretty much covered all of our bases with all the weapons. You see here, some of these 1911s we recycled and used for some of the Eastern prison break scenes. Now let's talk about the Tommy guns. Can you imagine back then you can just go in, uh, buy a Thompson submachine gun? That would be incredible. We do know that in the raid in Joplin that the Barrel Gang had a Thompson uh, that they had left behind. There's photos of that. Doesn't seem like they had done much with them after that. They never did discover uh, any more with them after that so maybe that was it for the tommy guns and the barrow gang clyde liked his bars uh the penetrating power of the of the 30 six i would also say that the lawmen that at that era were noticing that the 45s of the thompson weren't penetrating the sheet metal very well of those cars back then the sheet metal was thick and the thompson's you know was a 45 and it was a, 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 a smaller cartridge so they weren't getting the penetrating power they needed on those cars so the Thompson was actually not at the ambush it wasn't in the ambusher's hands and there weren't any in Bonnie and Clyde's car 
But being that this is a movie in the 1930s and everybody loves Tommy guns, it was requested that there would be a Tommy gun in the lineup of the ambushers, and they uh, they use the Tommy also for the Easton break, prison break. So I can't complain. I love Thompson machine guns, so there we have it. Now, if you're still with me and watching, then you are a gun lover. And your favorite scene was probably the gun store scene. Can you imagine walking in and buying all that stuff off the wall and walking out with it? Amazing. Anyway, the Colt Monitor was more of... Uh, the Colt Monitor was more of something that was issued to lawmen. There weren't a lot of those made. It wouldn't, I don't think, have been on the wall uh, of a store back then. But we needed to have everything on the wall for an impressive gun purchase, so up it went with everything else, and it was still a great scene that I love. I reminded Kevin not to say custom pistol grip in reference to the monitor. That was an early script thing, and I had asked them to take that out and they did um it didn't really make sense it wasn't a custom feature it's just one of the features that made the colt monitor the colt monitor versus uh uh you know the, a lot of the differences from the bar he appreciated that and he quit using the word in the dialogue the custom pistol grip but it, it there was one take where he, he had said it and it made it in the show with the editing and everything else but you know it still works fine kevin was great about going over each and every weapon and the dialogue he's a great actor great guy and he wanted to know he wanted to actually know everything he was saying he wanted to speak with authority so we went over the half moon clips popped in some 45 dummy rounds dropped them in the cylinder of the 17th smith he wanted to go through all the actions so that he knew like well, when i'm saying like a moon clip what does that mean what how do you use it that sort of stuff uh, so we went over every gun and all the lingo and and it was it was uh it was pretty cool to see him do that as as an actor now, it was his decision to throw uh, the Winchester in there, something that, quote, doesn't jam. That was his addition with the dialogue as well, which I admire, of course. I love old Winchesters. I had made sure we had one for the ambush scene in the end anyway because there was an obscure reference that there was a uh, Winchester 94 30, 30 present at the ambush. And I, maybe not in reality, I, you know, but somebody said there was one there, and I, of course, love them, so I kept it in there. It it probably would have been something that the ambush character would have brought with him, his personal gun, but now that Kevin had added it to the scene, it could definitely have come from the gun store as well for the story to work. So all these guns, I mean, <laughs> Kevin walks out with a couple in his right hand, and then you got the poor gun store owner walking out with his handful it was a very delicate procedure to uh, get for, you know get them set up. They're about to call action and uh, and then put all of these in their arms just right. It weighed so much that we had to wait until just the right moment to load this guy up so that he could walk out with this handful of firearms. And every time we would reset for the next take, there I was with a little stain pen touching up the stocks where the metal sights were putting their nicks and scars <laughs> on the guns and stuff. So we left out the 03 Springfield with the glass from what he was carrying. It was a super nice rifle with a super nice scope and it was a loner and we didn't want any put any scratches on it. We had to make sure it returned pristine. So Kevin was like, you know what, is that gun sort of special? Because he saw me babying it. And I said, well, I got to make sure it comes back perfect. And uh, he was really cool about it. He said, look, man, the camera's not going to see that that's not in his arms. Tell that owner that I said we're not putting any marks on that. And we just left it out of that scene. He was right. You don't notice that he's not actually carrying the 03 Springfield out. Your second favorite scene, if you love guns, might have been the shootout at the end, the posse scene, the ambush. Let's go over what we chose and why and we'll try to separate fact from fiction and fact from legend. So, originally the script called for Frank Hammer to carry the Colt Monitor. When I had a show and tell with Kevin with all the weapons, obviously he appreciated how awesome the Monitor is, but he asked me what did Frank carry historically. I said he carried the Model 8 Remington, and Kevin said, I want to be as accurate as I can, and I'm going to carry the Model 8. So I said, all right, and I... Ran it up the flagpole with the director and everybody, and they said, well, that's great. Give Woody the monitor, which turned out to be a really cool choice and worked out very well. Woody 
Woody loved, loved using that. I don't know why there is a monitor hanging in the museum or when Frank got it, but it was not at the ambush by Frank's own account. The only fully automatic weapon at the ambush was Hinton's BAR. If you read any accounts or biographies of Hamer, he was like God's gift to marksmanship. He was just amazing at accuracy and made every shot count. That was his mentality, make every shot count. He wasn't about spraying lead everywhere. And he once said of the Thompson machine gun that it wasn't good for much except facing down a mob. Of course, that had its moments of need, but he would have carried just a rifle at the ambush scene. He was once out back of a place that he and the rangers had raided and shut down. It was some gambling establishment. And he was sharing his marksmanship with some onlookers, and they're throwing up teacups and saucers in the air, and he'd blow them out of the air with his Remington, his Model 8. And so a Remington representative caught the show and uh, took that news back to his superiors, who were quite impressed, and they presented Hamer with a custom fully engraved Model 8 Remington. Hamer carried this on and off hunting and stuff, but I'm not sure that this is what he used at the ambush. Um, pretty much no, he didn't use this at the ambush. Would have been cool if he did, all engraved and presented to Captain Hamer of the Texas Rangers, but I think he used a plain Jane model that he had. There's a lot of misinformation out there that he actually carried this gun, which is a Remington with police modifications. Uh, especially obvious is that it has an extended magazine. Some people say 20 rounds. It actually only holds 15 rounds. Now the problem is that this particular weapon that's actually in the Texas Ranger Museum and is supposedly the ambush weapon that Frank used, um, the problem is that this is actually a Model 81. The Model 81 didn't come out until 1936. And this particular serial number of this weapon dates it to 1940. So, unfortunately, I don't see how this weapon was at the ambush in 34. I think he just, you know, he had a regular old Model 8, and that's what he was using and had used and what he was comfortable with. Now, the Model 8s, like the Model 11 shotguns, are recoil-operated. Again, the blanks don't give you the recoil to cycle to that next round. And again, the wizards at ISS performed some reconfigurations to this rifle to make it cycle through gas back pressure of the blanks. And it was uh, <laughs> quite an accomplishment, and it worked super well. I think we were one of the first shows to ever actually show a Model 8 shooting on camera, not just present on camera, or at least shooting more than once and continuing to fire. Did you take them up. So Woody got the Colt Monitor. Historically, I believe Maney had a Model 11 Remington shotgun with a with buckshot and perhaps a backup of the same, another Model 11. Probably had a couple sitting there ready to roll. In our film, he shoots the Colt Monitor uh, because, again, they're awesome. And uh, there is, you know, obviously some reference to it through some misinformation out there and... and uh, Either way, it's eye candy, and I love that it was in the film. They're extremely hard to find. They're very expensive, if you can find them. And without a pair sitting on the shelves ready for me, um, the, the uh, uh, folks down at ISS in the gun room had to whip up a pair. And so they pulled a pair of BARs and, and started going to work. And the Colt Monitor essentially was a, a it was Colt's version of the BAR, but modified to be a little bit more lawman friendly and have some additional features that were pretty cool. So they took a BAR, they shortened the gas tube and barrels, put the cuts compensator on the tips, modified the furniture to give us the proper shorter forearm stocks, and put the pistol grip on there. They turned out super well. Here's me appreciating the fact that these guns were made so well and got to me in time to shoot the scenes we needed. It's always a rush, rush, rush to get everything done in time for the scheduling and then gets shipped out to me. So um, ISS worked furiously to get these done on time and I was very happy when they showed up and looked as awesome as they did. The way Woody handles firearms is not completely unheard of, but it is unique. He shoots a rifle left-handed and a pistol right-handed.
David Bourne plays Sheriff Jordan, and in this movie carries a 94 model Winchester 3030. I had read one account where he had possibly carried that in the ambush. That's what I was saying earlier, that there was a an account where a Winchester did show up at the ambush, and that was that was from this. Um, probably more of a rumor. Again, I think it had. I think a lot of these guys had Model Eights, just like Hamer, um, and then you know uh, a backup shotgun or something. I'm a fan of these rifles, of course, and of westerns. And I thought, well, we always want a variety, so we're gonna keep that 30-30 in there. Brian Durkin plays Deputy Oakley, carrying in our film the Tommy Gun, because again, machine guns are awesome, and Tommy guns are awesome, and we just need them in the film. So there it was in our film. Historically, I'm going to say again uh, that uh, Deputy Oakley carried a Model 8 Remington. I'm going to repeat that a lot. I think that Model 8 was a very popular choice amongst these folks back then. Dean Denton, playing Deputy Bob Alcorn in our film, carrying an 07 model Winchester, 351 caliber with a 10-round magazine. Historically speaking, I'm going to say he carried a Model 11 Remington shotgun. And after firing five shots of buckshot at the barrel car, he uh, grabbed his spare rifle. And I'm talking historically, not in our show, but historically I believe he also he carried the Model 11. And then after he was done, he picked up a rifle and kept shooting. And you guessed it, I think his rifle <laughs> was also Model 8 back then. If you look at the reenactment film that they uh, shot just after the ambush historically, uh, to sort of a reenactment for the news uh, back then. It shows Alcorn holding his Model 8. Thomas Mann playing Deputy Ted Hinton in our film carrying a BAR. And historically, uh, he actually carried a BAR. Yes, we nailed it. In Hinton's book, he said he also had a semi-auto shotgun with five rounds, which would be the Model 11 Remington. He also had a pair of 1911 Colt 45 autos that uh, he had stashed on his person. Um, he says that he went through the 20 rounds in his BAR, and then he grabbed a shotgun and went through the five rounds of that. And then he finished his business of the day with one of those two handguns. All these guys just had backups upon backups besides what they were holding in their hands uh, of firearms, and they just lit that car up and then set a gun down and continued to perforate it. I mean, that car, there's a lot of bullet holes. Now, as far as the lineup, uh, the ambushers all lined up on that hill. Frank Hamer in his book said that they were lined up, but they were separated by about 10 feet apiece. And they weren't, they weren't all bunched up together like we see in the movie. And this was on purpose. He was trying to make them uh, all tougher targets for Clyde. So if Clyde was able to get to a, one of his BARs and start spraying lead, it would be difficult to hit everybody before they hit Clyde. Hamer uh, gave his lineup as follows. It was himself, then Galt, then Jordan, then Alcorn, then Oakley, and then finally Hinton. The first three ambushers, according to him, were to focus on the front seat, and Alcorn and Oakley were to be in charge of the back seat. If anybody was in it, they were to take care of uh, those targets. Hinton was to be in reserve at the end, and Hamer gave him instructions that with his powerful BAR, that if the, if the 34 Ford was about to take off, then Hinton was to spray the motor down and keep the, the car from leaving. Again, Hinton's BAR was historically the only full-auto weapon in the posse. Now, if you read Hinton's book, he said he was first in line. He says he was supposed to spot and recognize Bonnie and Clyde. Therefore, that being his responsibility put him in the lead. And his BAR was the most powerful gun there and had the longest, ra had the longest range. So he claims he was supposed to be in, in front. Either way, for the film... It looked cooler on camera and for uh, directorial purposes to have everybody everybody bunched up and everybody spraying lead together. And I agree, it looks pretty sweet. It's sort of a nightmare for an armor on set because they want everybody in a perfect line and they want to run that camera up and down and see everybody spraying, you know, uh, muzzle flames and ejecting brass. 
But each one of these guns ejects the brass out in different ways and in different directions. So it comes down to me telling each and every actor, okay, you take a step forward, you take a step back, you take a step back, now you take a step forward, you know, a little bit more forward, and uh, eventually we'd do a take, and then I'd make sure nobody got any hot brass hitting their neck, rolling down into their shirt, no, no burns or anything like that. Nobody getting hit in the face with any flying brass. It it was a it was a nice it, it worked out really well. It was a bit of work, but it, it worked out pretty sweet. Bonnie and Clyde, are they gonna move? Very tense, very tense. And gunfire. <laughs> I hope to keep putting out more content similar to this, so make sure you subscribe and, as they say, hit the notification bell and all that sort of stuff. And uh, as time and schedule permits, I'll keep putting stuff out there. Thank you very much.